This is the Push Shift Podcast, a raw look at the hospitality industry. Good morning, Push Shifters. It is Tuesday, which means it's another time for a Push Shift shot. I think we're on number 14 or 15 right now, which is just absolutely insane that someone hasn't messaged me and told me to fuck off by now. Um, I'm sure people are thinking it. Possibly. A lot of people might be saying they're loving it. So, um, today I wanted to sort of take it down a couple of notches, take it back to my roots of uh, bartending, drink making. And I started off as a as a bartender, I will always be a bartender regardless of what I do. I like being behind the bar. My body doesn't like me being behind the bar, but I like being behind the bar. And so today I want to talk about something that's a little bit lesser, like a little bit more lowbrow than getting what you want and all that sort of positive thinking and stuff. This is going to help a lot of managers out there um, decide how to make your house specs and how to include, be very inclusive on your staff, their experiences, their knowledge, their, um, where they grew up, where they got trained, that sort of thing, and sort of combine it into a really well-meshed team of knowledge, knowledgeable bartenders. So let me start off by saying house spec. I am a big proponent for house spec. If the house spec says that your old-fashioned is XYZ, then your old-fashioned is XYZ. It's not one bartender's version of XYZZ with a little splash of A in there, unless it's off the cuff. We're not talking about off the cuff today, we're just talking about house specs. And so house spec is very important because how many times have you gone to a bar or asked someone about what bar to go to and they've said, go to this bar, but as long as X, X bartender is working on that night, then you'll get good drinks. Any other time, don't bother going there. I've seen bar managers create whole bar programs around only time that, it, that it's good is when they are there making it. That's mind-blowingly stupid. It, it blows my mind that, that actually happens. I've seen cocktail menus that say drinks are only available after four o'clock, Monday through to Thursday, which is the bartender's shifts. Blows my mind. That is not how you build a cocktail program. That's not how you build a following. Um, but house specs are very important in the way that it gives you a repetitively consistency to build the culture. I think I, I lengthened that out a little bit too long, but um, I have a rule of thumb that creativity does not be build culture, consistency does. Consistency builds culture. And it's very, very important in this day and age to be consistent. There's plenty of cocktail bars out there being consistent and you do not want to be the one that falls by the wayside. But to get your house specs, um, I've developed something called the three Ds, which I've used in a couple of seminars now called democratic drink design, which sounds really fluffy and douchey and dicky and all that sort of stuff, but it makes sense. So, I came about uh, the three Ds when I moved, made the move from Clive's to open up Little Jumbo, which was my first cocktail bar and restaurant. And at Clive's, it was me and another bartender, me and Nate. And we'd worked together for four years. Um, he'd grown up basically behind that bar. And we sort of knew our shit. Um, but every now and then, there'd be a new cocktail come out in Imbibe or Liquor.com or something like that. It would be a, a forgotten classic or re, like a retweet classic or Wondrich would find an original recipe, something like that. And we'd have to redo our spec. And so what we'd basically do is we'd chat, we'd make a couple of drinks, taste, taste. Oh, that's the one, done. That's the new spec. But when we went up to Little Jumbo, I think we hired like five or six bartenders who were in rotation behind that bar at any given time. Um, and we had a big bar team, and a lot of them were not from Victoria. They were from Vancouver, they were from Toronto, um, and the East Coast has different flavor profiles. Vancouver has different flavor profiles than Victoria. Um, Victoria's big, very brown, bitter, uh, sour, whereas Vancouver is very sweet, um, in, in comparison for me, basically. And East Coast is a whole different animal again. So it's very funny how we all get into a little bubble of where our cocktail culture is, and I recently had a conversation just about... Um, Portugal, I'm going to Portugal for the Lisbon Bar Show in a couple of weeks and talked about like what sort of seminar I was going to do and I was going to do this really like fucking crazy highbrow shit that I've done at like San Antonio and Portland and stuff like that and the, the organizer like yeah that's a little bit too much um, there's sort of scenes like sitting like this and this is sort of where we want to sort of talk about it. I'm like cool I can do that and then just their flavor profiles the the distance of that culture they're sort of what they can get in Portugal compared to what they drink and so on and so forth is very very interesting and, and their culture is built around that um, but I, div I digress. Um, so when we went up to Little Jumbo, six different bartenders, all different flavor profiles, all different trainings, all different backgrounds. And so we all came together and we started going through the classics, Mai Tais, sidecars, daiquiris, so on and so forth. 
And we built, we built out our specs by sitting down over a space of a week before shift and banging out a whole bunch of classics and creating our specs. Um, we'd create, like, we'd say, okay, well, it's Mai Tai's turn. Who's got recipes for Mai Tai? Three hands would go up. Three hands would make up three different Mai Tais. they get put up. We'd all taste them. We'd go, okay, which one do you think this one? Two hands. Which one do you think this one? One hand. Which one do you think this one? Three hands. Awesome. This is our new house spec. That is it. Done. It's in stone. Our house spec. And so we created this sort of culture where anybody could put their hand up and go, hey, I found a new recipe. I was doing some research. Do you think we could change their house spec? And it would be a democratic way of changing our recipes to not only sort of push our own culture, but also show that we're a family creating drinks together. It's not one bartender showboating over another bartender and so on and so forth. So it sort of built this sort of culture of inclusivity um, where everybody's ideas were seen as equal, regardless if you've been in issue 20 years like me or 18 months like Brandt. At the end of the day, as an older manager, we can't compete with how much knowledge is out there in the universe. When I started in this industry, I've still got 500 books back home in Australia that are in storage that I'll probably never bring over. The ones that before the internet, you'd have to go to a bookstore and pick up a cocktail book. You'd research the cocktail book. You'd go through and see the notes. I've, I found recently one of my old notebooks from 2006 where I would literally be writing down different versions of history notes and finding the one that correlates the best. And that would be my new history note. Um, but that, those sort of things is like, as we get older as bartenders, one, we, we, we fall out of always having the finger on the pulse in the way of like reading every liquor.com article or reading everything, single post on Facebook, that sort of thing. And there's just so much information out there. It's just on you all the time. But the youngsters, they're learning way quicker. The stuff that I know now, they know already. And they're freaking 14 years younger than me. It's insane. So why not open up your doors? Be open open and opportunistic to create the best bar program you can possibly build around the people that you have. They are your resources. They are your assets. Um, you don't know everything as a manager. We don't know everything. We, we need to expand our own minds because they might tr teach us something. Now there'll be every day, there'll be, there'll be nine times out of 10, you'll be like teach them something about inventory, teach them something about cleanliness, teach them about something about service. But then that one time they'll freaking bring you something and you're just like, fuck. I didn't know that. Fuck, that's awesome. Fuck, let's put it on the menu. So, what does that say? Be open, be opportunistic, use the people in your team to the best possible availability. They're there 40 hours a week working beside you. Use them, use them, use them, use them. There may be some random little uh, region specific drink that that town's the only one that drinks it and that person comes from that town they're like, you know what, I can make this into a drink. And then they bring it to you and you're just like, man, that's amazing. Why didn't I think of that before? Oh, okay, that's why, because it's not on the internet. And so to tie this all off, democratic drink design, it opens the door for everybody to learn more. It opens the door for a full inclusivity on knowledge sharing, emotions, um, everything. Like it really brings the team together really tightly. And, and I think Foxtrot Tango Whiskey, when I did that with the team that I had at Foxtrot Tango Whiskey, that really showed me exactly what the three Ds could really build. Um, where we had a Facebook group chat and we'd literally like blah, 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 all these ideas. And then we sort of like, we'd funnel it all down. By the time we all got into work, we had a recipe or some sort of like rough mold of a recipe that we could possibly utilize. And so utilize the people you have, be thankful for and grateful for all the people that work with you. Um, happy drink making. I know this is a little bit more obscure for me. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, subscribe. If you're watching on Facebook uh, or you, Twitter, comment, give me some feedback, ask questions, um, anything. I'm always open. I want to, I, I'm, it's a two way door. See, I'm pointing at you to give me something. And I know that if you're watching this, listening to this on the podcast, you're not really understanding what I'm doing, but please subscribe, follow, rate, do everything. Thank you for your support. I appreciate it immensely. Um, that's your post shift shot for this Tuesday. I'll see you on Friday. Bye. Thanks, post shifters. I hope you enjoyed that episode. Uh, if you're listening, whatever platform you're on, give me a good rating, subscribe, listen along. Uh, I'm going to keep going. I really enjoy sitting down with people and learning where they're from, what they did, and how they got to where they were. So if you love it, give me a good five stars. If you don't, give me one and I'll try harder.